A very famous VC once said to me, who are your competitors when I was younger? I said a couple of companies, but I said, I really don't like to say that because they're all very different. He goes, yep. He goes, you know what you should say? I said, what? He said, baseball. He said, because you and baseball want the same things, eyeballs. You want to be the person putting input into somebody. And so the notion that I'm competing against someone else who provides a similar platform, he's not thinking about me and I'm not thinking about him. And so if we spend time thinking about that, digital companies don't see each other in the same competitive landscape than two coffee houses across the street from each other on Fifth Avenue. What's going on, everyone? And welcome to the next episode of The Next Big Thing HQ, where we have a very special guest with us today. His name is Jeremy Fromer. He started at Solomon Brothers, The Michael Lewis Days, Liars Poker, and was depicted in Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys. He spent 20 years working on Wall Street as a hedge fund and portfolio manager on the sell side of the financial industry and built and sold two financial service companies. He is the CEO of Created with the ticker symbol VOCL. Jeremy, thank you for coming on. Connor, thank you for having me. So Jeremy, I want to get into it. You run a blog right now, ceoblock.com, which is a case against naked short selling. So what is naked short selling and why is it such an issue? Well, one of our subsidiaries is an activist company called CEO Block that's dedicated towards wiping out naked short selling. Naked short selling is relatively simple. It's the act of short selling, which is legal to do, getting done in an illegal way. It is the act of short selling without the appropriate borrows and without the appropriate filings around it and the appropriate transparency to know the person could in fact have taken a short position because short selling requires what's called a bona fide borrow. And in the absence of being able to prove bona fide borrows, the system has been riddled with phantom shares created by naked short selling. And those are just the, essentially, it's the creation of shares into the market that aren't actually borrowed by pre-existing shares that are part of the issued and authorized and outstanding. So can you explain how this process works in layman terms? Yeah, I mean, in the most layman terms, well over 10 years ago, you could essentially short a stock and not have to prove that you had a bona fide borrow for up to 30 days. And so as long as you either did one of two things, whether you got the borrow or not, as long as you didn't have the position 30 days later, you could get away with that period of time, never having actually followed the rules. And those very lawless days, you know, those are the Jordan Balfour days of, of Wall Street the boiler room days of you ever see that one Connor? boiler room Vin diesel no i haven't you never saw boiler room with Vin diesel? i'll put it on my list God, <laughs> please put that on your list but you know those days were days of people just getting away with that stuff now over time that rule evolved and what you have now is a much shorter time frame but people are able to beat the system still i don't want to geek out on the details of how they beat the system but they are able to continuously beat the system because the solve requires a very, what I would argue is a finite solve, where after which, because of technology, we have the ability now to prove whether or not someone has a bona fide borrow instantaneously. And we're still at days right now, you know, like you can still have days to get away with it. So when a stock is in trouble, or when a stock is perceived to be in trouble and is taking a beating from legitimate short sellers, those short sellers benefit from the additional naked short selling. And it's the story of supply and demand. If it's happening in my own stock, you know, there's just an infinite amount of shares, no matter how big a demand there is. And this builds up huge naked short positions. I mean, it's not a secret anymore. There's articles about it two days ago about the rule changing because they openly admit that 
AMC had something like $2 billion of failed to deliver. $2 billion, $3 billion. I mean, to put in perspective, my company with its tiny market cap in the last two years has had over, I think it's over $160 million of value fail to delivers. And our stock's only worth at this moment in time, in this depressed market, it's like a sub $5 million market cap. But we've had $160 million of fail to delivers. That's what's public because we've had over 29 million shares in the last two years alone that have been publicly reported as fail to delivers at VOCL. And you could take a multiplier of that somewhere to the tune about five to six to kind of think of kind of what the 80 20 rule or 90 10 rule to figure out what's going on illegally because the market is riddled with fraud these days. The entire stock market is riddled with true fraud. And in particular, when it comes to short selling, you could apply a multiple of five to like that 25. You could see that we can have our entire fluke could be 100% naked short. And as long as the algorithms that are run by the market makers, which use the market maker exemption to get away with these crimes, they will continue to do this across the entire small cap marketplace. They will are committed to making money by short selling, naked short selling on top, constantly paying small fines. Citadel and Goldman Sachs were fined a few weeks ago, $6 million each, $6 million. It's nothing. It's, it's nothing. It's, it's nothing there. And so they don't care. They made 500 million. Goldman's most profitable business, I believe, is its back office. It always was. I knew the guys there from Spe the guys, Goldman Sachs didn't build that. They're not the greatest rocket scientists everybody thinks they are. Goldman Sachs, you know, away from the fact that they're running away from a lot of the businesses that they, you know, had committed to over the last year, which is one of the first times I've seen them make kind of about face so publicly. But Goldman Sachs's back office has to do with them buying Spear Leads and Kellogg. That's really what it was all about. You know, it was, that's how they got into the business of dark pools and electronic trading all through Spear Leads. Well, I saw a stat that said, and I don't know how true it is, but it said Goldman Sachs makes 75% of its income in the stock loan department. Like 75%. I don't know how accurate that is, but just the fact that it's that big and it let, represents that much let, of their income. Let's say it was 25%. Yeah. That would be crazy too. Yeah. Right? What happens is Spear Leads was ahead of the time with electronic trading. Much of my electronic trading education came sort of by learning from the guys at Spear Leads. And actually Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns had one of the greatest back office, prime brokerage, stock loan departments. It was Bear Stearns and Spear Leads uh, back in the 90s. Spear Leads provided liquidity and then Goldman Sachs eventually got on top of liquidity providing as their main form of transactional money-making business. Because investment banking comes, goes, and they're trading bets. I mean, I could go down a whole thread about whether or not these banks should be engaged in proprietary investing. And nobody knows they're not supposed to do it. They are supposed to do it, but they get away with it, right? And by the way, they mask a lot. Goldman Sachs for sure does this. They mask a lot of the revenues that they call proprietary trading as part of these market making algos. How do they mask it? And, you know, because the market making algo may provide an opportunity or an understanding that the Goldman Sachs proprietary desk has an advantage because it understands how to trade even against it. So in theory, market making might lose money at the expense of a proprietary trading desk that's using the dark pools, the liquidity pools, the technology to make a lot of money. And we used to do that all the time back in the late eighties, early nineties. I mean, everybody wanted their bonuses to work throughout the firm, right? right? So often enough, you would revenues from one book would move to another book. And believe me, Goldman Sachs has enough sophistication to do that, as does Jamie Dimon. All the numbers that you hear out of banks are just fictitious. Okay. They're all fictitious. Remember, I sat on operating committees in these banks. 
Royal Bank of Canada, you know, Bank of America, Bankers Trust. I sat with all these senior guys, you know, revenues and expenses and losses and profitability are all movements that occur amongst thousands of finance people across a globe. The number they report is not some perfect number. It's whatever came of a lot of people working to create a perception. And ultimately, that perception becomes reality on Wall Street. That's the nature of Wall Street. So from your experience, how do you view Wall Street now? You were working on Wall Street for 20 plus years. You know, you started at Solomon Brothers. What's your perception on Wall Street now? Because it seems like you're taking a very head-on approach to try and tackle this problem of these institutions using naked short selling to really depreciate or depress the stock prices for these small cap companies and make a lot of money from shorting those stocks. As a caveat to my answer, I would say that, you know, Wall Street has always been about making money with no emotions. It was like that hundreds of years ago around a button tree downtown, and it's still like that today on computers. I started, just so we clarify my career, I was a kid in college and in high school who started trading options as my pastime. I used to trade Coca-Cola, Coke options, and IBM options. And I used to have to do it by going to a Charles Schwab office in Albany, where I went to SUNY. And I didn't start my career on the street until 91. I got out of Albany in 90 and had worked during my summers at Solomon Brothers and had gotten to know the Solomon Brothers people and the culture when I finally got my first job at Kidder Peabody, I worked for an amazing individual who also was in one of Michael Lewis's books. His name is Tom Bernard, and he is depicted as a character, if you read Liar's Poker, called the Human Piranha. In any event, the Wall Street that I was taught by these individuals over time changed significantly, mostly because what I articulated as the desire to make money and be transactional was not always at all costs. The people that I worked for were for the most part very honorable, true. Guys like Joe Jett and Bernie Madoff and other characters and Balfort and all these guys floated through our paths because it was a small Wall Street world back in the late 80s and early 90s in New York. But that Wall Street became manipulated. And it started with the advent of tech. I was there at the very moment that that occurred. Tech allowed and still allows a new era of people to take advantage of stock trading and other market manipulative forces. Oil doesn't trade the way it does without many people have planned out how oil should trade over the next month. And those are the only people that ever really make money trading oil. The rest of us are just grease and flies around. And so over time, the market manipulated itself to a point where market maker technology at broker dealers and broker dealers themselves began to mask things between what was proprietary versus what was for the retail investor, which is what the banking infrastructures initially began for. And they turned into, okay, can we make commissions on those things to those commissions disappearing? And when those commissions disappeared because of technology, we went from paying real commissions to paying a $10 a month subscription and trading all you want. We went from paperwork, which yes, was manipulated in the short selling arena to being in a world where technology allowed us to manipulate it in thousands of ways that nobody could have imagined if you were from an era where these things weren't possible. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so once technology intervened, the industries that have come up around it, it's kind of like no different than NFTs, right? right? Any place where people can exploit, they're going to exploit. And so the micro cap and the small cap markets, particularly after the technology revolution, call it, let's say 2012, 2014, where you could target and market, understand and compile data in a new way. Retail investors then became the fodder for the experimental stuff that was going on 
as far back as day trading in the late 90s, right? You ever hear of a concept called a SOS bandit? No, what's that? SOS was an electronic trading or order system, and it allowed, without getting into too much details, it allowed an edge to a trader who had it versus a trader who didn't. It was not a democratized environment. Technology un you know, upended all that. If you all have to call the broker, the best thing that the broker might have is color that someone else doesn't have. They used to call that inside information. And now they spend so much time going after inside information as opposed to addressing what is a problem like, you know, tenfold bigger, except it doesn't have a celebrity's name. And so instead of addressing the real underlying problems in the market, the regulators just want to make names for themselves because most of them are focused on their careers. And so in the end, trading the Wall Street that I began with that you asked about is no longer exists. It's not a real thing anymore. That whole world is gone, replaced by technology and a highly fragmented legacy of what used to be called the middle markets. There is no capital markets other than for the top four or 500 companies on the exchanges. And we're in for a horrifying awakening about this entire infrastructure that represents, you know, real people's savings and, and real people's futures. So talking about the impact technology has had on Wall Street and the system in general, you have a tweet that says, I have always said that blockchain is one of the best answers. Transparency in the market is key to getting the best result. So do you think, I guess... The system's going to continue drifting further and further away from the 1990s, or do you think that blockchain's going to become implemented in a lot of these companies going forward, and it's going to help create that transparency needed in the market? I think that blockchain is one component of that, but I think that what happens in the business cycles I've been around, and I'm watching it myself, right? I was a rah-rah Wall Street, you know. I remember walking around when the Occupy Wall Street movement was going on and just being clueless as to what even these people were thinking about. And now I'm full steam the other way where all I care about is what those people are thinking about. And so things go through cycles, right? Technology moves through cycles. What's happening right now is we're in a trough within the cycle. And the cycle will be the gap that is needed to pull it out of the trough is a new look at technology, regulation, perhaps our morality, many things. And when you look at it a few thousand feet below that, you start to get into concepts like blockchain, alternative methods of financing like reg CFs for subsidiaries of public companies, what should be in my opinion, a gathering of CEOs to create real solutions for funding on a macro level where perhaps all of us participate in one way or another. You see, I think it's going to be a combination of blockchain technology. I always think that it's tech and network. And so what has to happen is the tech part is blockchain, it's reg CFs, it's trading systems that eventually fail to enforce, fail to delivers and borrows in immediate fashion. And it's network, meaning some fund somewhere. And I am not interested in tooting my horn. I'm interested in getting something done. So I am definitely one of the people running head first into trying to find the right kind of big fund VC family office that wants to take a broad view of what is the other 60, 70% of the stock market that is in significant distress. And how is it best? Done? And how do you save as many shareholders in companies that don't deserve to be where they are? And that kind of process and the kind of process that CEO Block is looking to do with Congress. Those are the things that I think ultimately change the market in addition to things like watch. So you talked about Reg CF for subsidiaries, and we interview a lot of founders that are raising Reg CF rounds. Vocal 
We recently launched a reg CF round and attracted 500,000 of interest in less than seven days. So tell me, why did you want to go the reg CF route? Well, if you're in my seat, if you're a CEO of a company, particularly one in distress, but with so much risk reward and opportunity, you have to explore every alternative at your disposal. You have no choice. That's the CEO's job. I was always aware of reg CFs since as far back as 2016. The problem with reg CFs at that moment in time was they were just the next evolution off of Kickstarter and India Go Go, right? Like, and those were not really trustworthy products in that, sure, you knew what you were putting money into and you would get something back. It was more like a marketplace than it really was an investment. And it was there to help people. And I have great respect for those platforms, right? right? But they were not regulated platforms. And so as that world became more regulated, you had to have a regulation. Okay. Regulation CF began with, you know, the ability to raise a few hundred thousand dollars. And then even when they upped it to $1.2 million, the expense of setting one up, the expense of going through the process of learning to potentially, remember, anything in the beginning is there's no magic, there's no magic trick to solve these things. Reg CF is, again, one of many processes that a CEO has to entertain to survive if they're in the 60% of the market that's going to get continuously de synthetically depressed by these technical factors. And so if you want to escape them, you have to fight. And so once Reg CF were raised to five million dollars, I think in 2020. That's when everybody woke up. Problem was there was no way to do a reg CF back then in a way where your success could be a function of both your network and a targeted network that you could reach out to if you had the right kind of data and the right kind of audience to talk to. And then over the last couple of years, we have followed the development of the multiple kind of I call it, there's about 10, 10 platforms out there right now that do it. That And by the way, they each have their own problems. There's not one great, like so people ask me all the time because they know I've looked at every single one, right? They know yeah. I've spoken to the CEOs of all of them because as a Wall Street guy, as a CEO of a tech company, our vocal platform, which is our social media platform, the, the jewel of our corporate company still is very reliant on data. And so I'm a data, I'm a data person and I needed to meet all those people. And, and every single one of them will tell you the same thing. We're still at the nascent stage of reg CFs. We're in the discovery mode, the research mode. And so the first reason why I chased it was that I'm a person who knows that if a company is going to survive, I must understand all aspects of the opportunities that are out there to raise capital. So you started raising it. How has this round gone so far? There have been successes and mistakes. We have well over half a million dollars of interest at this point, probably have about a million and change. And interest means that you have, in our case, it's approximately 2,000 people that have indicated interests of up to a million dollars. Of those, about 200,000 plus have, and this is just in 30 days, right? So we launched 30 days ago. And in that 30 days, and we had a sort of soft launch prior to that where it just went around to my group, but that was before we were able to raise it to the levels we've raised it to now. And so over the last 30 days since we began marketing it, we've taken in exactly what I said about the million and change of interest, about 200,000 200, of assign documents that are going through various stages of view, and then about 110,000 of funded money. And so most of your money, whatever you're going to make, 60% of your money in a reg CF is made in like the last 20 days. When you decide to close a thing, whatever you're going to raise is going to come in prior to that close. So most of it comes in then. And so I think that my feedback from people we deal with is that all the numbers I just articulated are very healthy numbers, very good numbers, yes. actually. 
Now, if you look at reg CFs, I mean, I think only 22 hit a million in the last, whatever, it's been six months or something like that. It is still a very nascent, just like blockchain, right? Just like upstream as a blockchain exchange, which I'm a fan of in the blockchain world, deal maker, public, we funder. I'm fans of those groups also, but they're all just at the beginning. And as someone who built a platform, which as I was alluding to earlier, someone who built Vocal, which is now a eight-year-old platform with over two million, you know, creators and half a million visits a day and the kind of, you know, infrastructure that we built. I mean, that cost 70 million over seven years to build that. And so it's interesting to me as a builder of tech, both when I was in the financial services industry and in the digital space, to watch the evolution of these reg cf platforms and i can honestly say they're at the very beginning a mistake i made though was that he made the reg cf transaction a little too complicated you know you got to be able to separate the idea of is this kickstarter or is this an investment you know if you try to gamify it too much it doesn't really work you're attracting the wrong audience because you're not looking for game players. You're looking for investors. And so what my plan is right now, which is, this is really the first time that I've told anybody this is this Rex CF is very attractive, but I'm not into wasting time. If the feedback I'm getting is that people would rather me do a second reg CF again, this one was a less risky, very high reward reg CF meaning the terms of it. If someone goes and looks at it, they'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And I'll send you all that information to maybe put in the yeah, we'll put in description the of our discussion. But in reality, what people really want is a direct equity interest in something because they understand that, right? And so setting up a preferred where people get to participate in our revenues, too complicated. And so my first suggestion to all CEOs, and I chat with many of them all the time, but I'd love to chat with new ones, is that if you're considering this private company, subsidiary of a public, whatever it is that you're trying to do to solve for alternative financing, that you rethink what all the pundits say, because they don't know what they're talking about, most of them. Because nobody who has not done a reg CF can tell me how a reg CF should be done. This. And the ones who try to tell us where it's not their money, they just participated as a part of a marketing team. They're just interested in getting their marketing dollars. And so they don't really read the audience the way we do. And what the audience wants and what we're going to do is eventually we're going to close out this one, which I hope everybody gets a chance to participate in. And then I'm going to set the remaining value of the Reg CF as straight equity into vocal the platform so that there's no confusion, no gimmicks, no gamification, no anything, no extra bonus shares, which is all great. If you take the time to understand it, that transaction is a great one. But most people, that's not what they're looking for. They want the quick answer. The yep. quick answer is, okay, the company is worth 50 million. You're going to buy in at 35 million. It's $6 a share. How many shares do you want? We're selling 10%, you know, and that's, that's the right way to do a reg CF. Yes. They get the equity. And I've always thought that the people investing on reg CF platforms or invest, investing into reg CF rounds, they want to become angel investors. They don't have the deal flow necessarily. So they're going to these platforms to see startups, to kind of get that taste and to invest in these companies and get equity. I've never really thought of those investors, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong or not, but those investors really wanting, oh, I want a big dividend every quarter and kind of treat this like a Coke stock. I always thought instead as no, they want to kind of invest in maybe the next Uber or something and get in early and invest in a startup that has potential to grow in the future. That's correct. What I would say is most Reg CF investors don't want limited upside, yes. even though it promises to create limited downside which is what you're saying, you know, they're not looking for a dividend. And I mistakenly thought, okay, let me offer what I thought was a safe investment 
and it's about disclosure, right? right? Like now when I go out, I'm gonna go to, you know, all of the creators on vocal. I'm gonna go to all of the audience and say, all right, own straight equity. And if we sell the company for 500 million in, you know, 10 years, well, then you just participated in the next Amazon type of return. And that's what I'm gonna try to do. That's what has to happen and that's what's gonna mm -hmm. happen. And I'm a person who, again, you asked earlier why Reg CF is like, I had to discover it. We're the only OTCQB company to spin out a subsidiary into the private world that now is functioning in the Reg CF world. I, I don't believe that's ever been done in the OTC space. No, I don't think so either. And tell us why. Why did you decide to go that route? What did you see, I guess, reducing the pressures for the OTC QB company doing the spinoff and raising the Reg CF round? I mean, that's like the same question I get asked when people say to me, you know, why do you keep fighting, right? Oh, okay. And there's two answers. You know, one is my family depends on me, and so I have to keep. Second answer is some of us, that's what we do. We try to push the boundaries. I've often said in articles that I've written and spaces I've given that it has been my life's privilege to be a risk taker and to experience the rewards of being a risk taker. Not everybody gets to do that, and I'm very thankful for it. At times, that lifestyle can be real rough like it is now. And if you face it, with the same determination, you will find paths to follow and to get you out of the woods. And Reg CF, just like blockchain, just like talking to lobbyists, just like going to Washington, D.C., like I did last winter as a CEO, stand with shareholders in front of the SEC and protest, which didn't see many other CEOs showing up. I believe I have to, the thing I'm supposed to do is be a voice because I'm the one who's the biggest shareholder in my company. I do stand side by side with my investors. I'm not the CEO who will look at himself any other way. I'm the founder. That's a different type of CEO. I'm not a hired gun. I'm a person who's been here since the beginning, and my rest of my team has been here for eight, nine years with me. And so when we look at the Reg CF, I'll just look at it in that vein. We look at it as like, we believe that we must be at the tip of the spear. We must stay at the tip of the spear on all things so that not only can we help ourselves, but we can help the hundreds of companies, friends, peers, co-workers who work at other companies now that are experiencing it, agencies we deal with, all of them are experiencing what is the toughest environment I believe we've seen in the economy since as far back as the SNL crisis. The financial crisis in 08, it's no different than COVID. You experience a shock to the system and then they pump liquidity into the system to fix it. That's not what's happening now in the economy. No amount of liquidity being pumped in, not that there's going to be any liquidity pumped in, except probably liquidity pumped into the weapons building business right. that that will be doing. The military constructs will gain money right now, but growth stocks will not. And when the growth stock world comes to a pause and a long one as it's going to be, there are thousands of cottage industries around it that suffer. That's what's happening. And not really about us going for the Reg CF as much as it is as a company staying at the forefront of, si of survival. Yeah, and doing whatever it takes, right? At the end of the day. Doing whatever it whatever takes. Whatever it takes. Yeah. Now, I want to talk about Vocal. You said you have 2 million creators on there and you get half a million, what's it, viewers? People on visitors, visitors. Half a million. Well, Vocal has 2 million creators and those are called the freemium creators, and if someone goes to vocal.media or even just a Google the word vocal, V-O-C-A-L, like to be vocal, you'll see what it is. It's a creator social media platform where creators of all types, whether they're video, photo, audio, podcasters like yourself, 
uh, you know, every podcast you've ever done, there should be an article around it on vocal because vocal is a great channel for any creator to find an outlet that is safe, where the audience is targeted for them, where there's no programmatic intrusive advertising, where they can make where they can earn or be rewarded for their content because they get rewarded like a YouTube, they get rewarded per reads, per views, they get tips, they can have creators subscribe to them monthly. Many of the sites such as Medium, Substack, Patreon, the list can go on, Wattpad. You know, these are companies that are worth five, six hundred million dollars. We do similar type of revenues, similar type of growth similar type of amount of creators, audience members, and essentially vocal has become a premier name for creators to find a place to reach an audience and publish their content. And that's been great. Like I've never been more excited than when I get a comment on something I write, you know, it's not. I'm not there for the money. I'm there to build my audience, right? Right. And that's what a very famous VC once said to me. He said, who are your competitors? When I was younger, he said, who are you competing? I said a a couple of companies, but I said, I don't like to say that because they're all very different. He goes, yep. He goes, you know what you should say? I said, what? He said, baseball. How so? He said, because you and baseball want the same things eyeballs. Everybody just wants eyeballs. All you're competing for in the world today is for eyeballs, yep. for sensory and you want to be the person putting input into somebody. I'm competing against television. I'm competing for your time. And so the notion that I'm competing against someone else who provides a similar platform, he's not thinking about me and I'm not thinking about him. Right. All we're thinking about is the great world of eyeballs. And there's more than enough for us to all go around. And so if we spend time thinking about that, digital companies don't see each other in the same competitive landscape than two coffee houses across the street from each other on Fifth Avenue do, you know? Right, because everyone needs coffee. Right. Everybody's going to go in at some point. Right. You just got to keep them coming back to you more often than not, right? That's right. the name and of the how game. do you achieve that recurring revenue model, which is what Vocal is? It's a recurring revenue model not dependent on, you know, the advertising woes of brands today. It's dependent on creators subscribing for its premium platform the same way you subscribe for your premium platforms on Netflix yeah. or Spotify or wherever you want to get your creativity. So what made you want to start Vocal? What was the genesis of starting this? Because you were working in the you know, Wall Street, banking industry, financial services for a while to then go into, let's just say the content creation route, it doesn't seem like a a linear kind of path. I'll show you the link and then you'll do the uh Uh (laughs) uh-huh. So in 2012, when I finally left Wall Street, one of the things that was really happening and I kind of had a crossover knowledge of it was Facebook and what was going on with their advertising product. And mostly because it was about data, which I had been very much a part of on Wall Street, right? Like most of my day on Wall Street was spent in the fintech world. So the aggregation of data was something that was being thought through now on different levels by Facebook and many of the social media and Google over the preceding six or seven years leading up to 2011. And I knew I'd had enough of Wall Street. The Wall Street that I had been a part of no longer existed and there was no point in me trying to you know, fight to be in a world that I didn't really want to see myself living in the rest of my life. But I did love arbitrage. And in the beginning, there was no thought about vocal. It was simply a thought that if I could buy enough content, which I did, I bought a bunch of general media's assets, a bunch of magazines and buy content and mix it with new content that I could create the type of websites with the right technology and understanding that I had with the group of people I was with, such that we could arbitrage what was then a very widespread arbitrage of programmatic advertising, pop-ups, all that stuff, on websites where you would basically pay X dollars to Google for search. Google would send people to you, 
and pay you a CPM that was higher than you were paying out. And I thought, well, that's a great arbitrage. I'll pursue that. And that's how I started to learn about basic web building back in like 2011, basic website constructions around search engine optimization. Now that very much quickly, my Wall Street experience taught me that commissions and spreads never array. I've never seen an ARB that worked forever. No arbitrage works forever. In fact, in today's world, arbitrages are very short-lived, particularly ones that don't serve up some sort of fundamental value as part of the proposition for both sides of the arbitrage. And in programmatic advertising, what was happening was the spreads were compressing, just like they had been throughout 2013 and 14. And that was when my brilliant partner, Justin Mori, and his team, Think Mill out in Australia, put together a plan which said, look, we can't depend on this spread anymore. What we need to depend on is building an environment where the people that we've been able to garner so far would want to come for a subscription-based model. And at the time, there were very few people who were doing subscription-based well. You know, Medium was one of the few groups and Medium didn't charge anything. And now they do. And now there's all sorts of methods for, you know, subscriptions. And then we entered the world. We were early to the world of everything was going to become subscription-based. Nobody was going to continue to give everything away for free on the internet. And no arbitrage was going to continue to last forever. People who believe in static worlds in technology are the first to fail. Yes. Because there's no static. There's no stasis that is static inside of uh, SaaS development. It is constantly evolving because there's constantly more data. And so it was very clear to me that I went from in a world where I arbitraged stocks to a world where we were arbitraging eyeballs and digital content to a world where we're no longer arbitraging, but we're providing a service that costs X, that is valued at Y, and we have a fan base and a user base that believes in the ecosystem and the community that we've built that is not only participating in that community, but also, as we discussed earlier, investing in it through the Reg CF and really becoming a very hybrid, new age kind of company. But you have to go through a lot of pain to be the first guy. You know, do you know who Ray Dalio yes. is? Connor? Yes, I do. You know, Ray Dalio is the one who says you have to bet against what the market perceives of you, fight through it, and be right. That's the only way. Yes. You have to bet against what everybody else is thinking and be right. In some aspect, that's almost like a prerequisite to being successful in a new endeavor or doing something new, right? If you're doing something new, in reality, people are not going to agree with what you're doing, especially if it's going to be successful in the long run, right? So you have to kind of accept the people saying, oh, you're doing this wrong and everyone kind of betting against you as a way of, no, I think I'm onto something because if they knew what I knew, they would be on my side. They wouldn't be thinking the way they're thinking. I think that's true. That's one component. The other component is it is awful when the place you're trying to do something new in, right? Right. If you win, it threatens an institutionalized infrastructure. And so then it's not just that people are naysayers or people, you know, are just looking for the other guy to fail. That we all go through in life, right? right. As human, the, the brain is very strange how it works that way. But when you're up against forces, those forces will come out in mass to stop you. And it's not just that you're going to go through a hard time. In our case, in Wall Street and the market and the small cap space, they're going to destroy your equity value and try to put you out of business. Because if you're, again, I would doubt the loss of the name of our company, there should be no loss on you of why I called it that. I would say that I'm probably the most vocal CEO on Twitter, certainly one of them in the small micro cap space. And so I put a target on myself because of that. And you've seen that if you, you know, followed my story a bit. And so sometimes it's, you got to not just try to do the thing, be right, because there are people who are going to wish you wrong. 
There's you got to be right and then you have to fight the other people, which all goes back to your original question at the start of our interview today about short selling and naked short yep. sell. And the problem behind that. Well, we're getting real low on time. So one last question. Advice sure. for someone who is a CEO or aspiring to be a public CEO? I would say my most important is advice is don't believe the experts. Don't believe what you hear particularly if they're looking to be a CEO or be a part of the public markets. And one of the 20,000 OTC stocks, and or if you're part of the lower 3,000 in the NASDAQ stocks and New York stocks, if you're any of those 15, 25,000 people that are constantly moving through those jobs, it's time to stop believing what you hear. Even your attorneys are wrong. Your accountants are wrong. They're not spending the time thinking abstractly. They're not thinking about how the world will come to an end that they believe is static and you won't be prepared. That's not their job. And so my advice to CEOs today, maybe not what I would have said a year or two ago, and maybe not what I'll say in three years when things are better. Today, beware. Surround yourself by people who are thinking abstractly, derivatively. They're thinking in multiple time frames, agile, dimensional, alternative. That's what you're looking for today. And that's my advice for the CEOs that you speak. Well, Jeremy, I appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. And real quick, where can people find you? I'm on Twitter and I answer my DMs. So, you know. They can find me on Twitter. They can go to Vocal, VO, they should go to Vocal, uh, vocal.media. And I write on my platform and I take comments there. I'm a very reachable guy. Anybody who wants to Google and figure out how to find me, they'll find me. Well, Jeremy, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Connor, for having me, man. And for all the listeners out there, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for supporting us. And... Go check out Jeremy on Twitter. It's capital J F R O M M one nine six eight underscore C R T D. Check him out on Twitter and check out vocal. We appreciate y'all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Jeremy. And y'all have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.